Hey everybody, Nate here. Very happy to welcome you back to the Essential Craftsman Podcast. We are talking about timber, lumber, logs, and forest fires today. And I'm telling you, mark my words, this will probably be the most controversial episode we've done yet. I predict there'll be some uh, very uh, emotional and passionate opinions in the comments on YouTube because this topic of the of managing our forest is just emotional. It's the only way to describe it. Last summer, we had forest fires that raged up and down the West Coast. They destroyed homes and forests and trails and campsites, including the childhood home of, of my dad and including, oh man, <laughs> including trails that that I grew up hiking and mountain biking on and when you drive through them now it's 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 unrecognizable and horrific. And so this conversation is talks we're talking about the logs, how they get out of there, how they're used, how the forests are managed currently and uh I think it's important we all get informed and I'm telling you I learned a lot listening to John talk about the timber industry or the lumber industry from a, a perspective that I've never heard before. So I am very grateful to him for coming on the show and, and informing us. And uh, if, if you listen to this whole thing, even if you are someone with a different point of view, you got to be grateful anytime you have a chance to get informed. So without any further ado, here is our conversation with John Blodgett of Douglas County Forest Products. He's a log buyer there. And Scott Wadsworth, who is the essential craftsman, and myself. I hope you enjoy it. To start with, and just for context from going forward, do you want to just give the big picture about what your mill in particular saws? Because I, I assume they specialize and are all different to some extent. Yeah, sure. So every mill is different. Like there's no mill that's a clone that I know of. They're all very unique in their own special way. So our mill, Douglas County Force Products, is a medium size, what I would consider a medium sized sawmill. And we manufacture a pretty tight mix of products, just two by fours and two by sixes, eight, nine, and 10 foot length, 100% really? kiln dried. You can have quite a few uh, variations within that because we have different species that are all sold as a different product. So we do dug fir, hemlock white fir, lodgepole, ponderosa, Engelmann spruce. Oh. So there's there's quite a bit of variation if you look at all the possibilities of dug fir, eight, nine, 10, two by four, two by six, mm -hmm. uh, number twos, premium, mm -hmm. e economy, web stock. So it seems like a really tight mix, but there's quite a few products. So hmm. if you're a mill that makes all kinds of links, like you could have 200 products. Sure. So yeah. So a couple questions off that that just occurred to me. So first of all, do you precision cut to stud length or are they just eight, yeah. nine, ten? Or you we you're precision cut. 104 yeah. and five. And, and we'll do a custom order for anybody because the building codes are different across mm -hmm. the country and somebody might have it or or they might just have a special project where they want it to be a very specific length. So we will precision mm -hmm. and trim okay. any product. And then the next thing web material. That's for webs and bar joists yep. and then tr for trust manufacturers. I, yep. had, I hadn't flashed on that. So you're, you're, are you selling that in short length? Yes. Yeah. So you're cutting, you're cutting the nice pieces out. All right. So you might have a nine foot. So if we're running a nine foot run, the board may look fabulous the first six feet and it may be trash at the mm -hmm. end. And mm -hmm. so we'll trim that back and have a quality, a high quality piece of web stock. Mm. And it's surprising how big that market is, Interesting. but all of the trusses are manufactured from that product. Mm -hmm. They're not buying nine foot lumber and trimming it down. Oh, they're buying the, the short yeah. lengths that fit their, yeah. their trust. And it needs to be a good piece of lumber, not a, not a piece sure. of economy. So mm -hmm. do you sell that web stock to local trust yards or just nationwide? Just, and nationwide. Just, I mean, yeah. but, but yeah. we do sell to those guys if they yeah. call us and they have money and tech, pay their bills. Yeah. Tech we, built or the guys up in Harrisburg sure. or yeah, anything we'll like that. Sell it to anybody. Right on. It's just a, a function of volume if, because mm -hmm. we produce so much of it you know, do they want to buy at the scope and scale that we produce? So in terms of volume, could a home builder who's building a lot buy directly from the mill or do you kind of only sell to wholesalers? Um, Cause you mentioned if someone has a specific length, they might want, you can make that happen. Mm -hmm. But what type of person, obviously a, a, a guy building his dream house, you know, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to sell to him. You know, I, I think it's a common question. Everybody's always asking, Oh, 
particularly like friends or acquaintances like, oh, could I buy some lumber yeah. from you? <laughs> There's not that much margin in it for the building supply company. Yeah. And they have a Moffitt and a delivery yep. truck. Plop. And they bring you exactly what you need the day that you need it mm -hmm. within the hour, mm -hmm. even yep. maybe mm -hmm. if they have good customer yep. service and they unload it with a forklift. Yeah. Yeah. If you come to my place, like we have the forklift. But you're on your own yeah, after that. And right. so you mm -hmm. you need to keep it covered. You need to store yeah. it on a flat level site. Um, yeah. And loading it in a conventional trailer is difficult because it needs to be side loaded on a flat car. Yeah, it could right. be a deck over or no help. Yeah. And so a lot of times, like I've I've helped people out and they end up dismantling the unit piece by piece <laughs> and then repiling. And so you do that one time and you, you didn't save mm -hmm. any money yeah, at yeah, all. So yeah. could anybody buy lumber from us? Yes. Yeah. But do you want to? Probably not. Yeah, but right. to what Nate's speaking to, if somebody's going to put in 175 apartment units in Las right. Vegas and they're and they want 104 and five eighths or 104 and seven eighths or whatever, bam, you can yeah. deliver that. Yeah, exactly. And they don't have to call their lumber yard. They might just be like, I'm going to just call the mill directly, and that wouldn't be too out of line. Yeah, and there are big builder groups that do that. Mm. They they do just that. They have the purchasing power to buy mm. direct from somebody like us. The Dell Webs and yeah. those guys can do that. And there's a surprising number of lumber brokers that guys that are pure middlemen that they oh. they live and work in an office mm -hmm. they never touch the lumber they facilitate it by purchasing it from us and selling it to somebody else at a margin oh, there's, and, there's and, it's yeah. a big industry and somebody because yeah. somebody who's needing things like i need two by sixes mm -hmm. and they're like oh you got to talk to douglas county <laughs> those guys yeah. they are the two by six kiln they, dried and we we aren't very flexible in payment terms or delivery and all those things and and maybe that is a service that the that the broker could provide mm. like hey i'll front you the money for 90 days or, or uh, you know yeah. whatever they are comfortable doing they do it like we're 10 days net you huh. pick it up pay us that's it oh that is so cool okay so that sets the stage and really what i'm the most interested in even though it's a little bit out of sight, out of mind for us. And so I know for the rest of the country it is as well. And that's the the forest fire summer from hell that mm -hmm. really the whole West had, but let's maybe just keep sure. it local in, in Oregon. Cause I assume for you guys, it's not out of sight, out of mind. You're, no, you're kind of like still uh, ground zero, right? Yep. So in late August, September, there were forest fires all up and down the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington. And, and that's not unusual. It happens every year. But this year, there were 800,000 acres that burned in Washington and over a million in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, so and that, that, that's, that's a big fire. Year. And that's uncharacteristic. Yeah. That's way beyond anything we ever have. And, mm -hmm. and not only that, this time they burned residential areas, which normally there's mm -hmm. very few, if any, yeah. structure fires. Historically, it's like you never read those headlines. Yeah. And so... There's a lot more press when yeah when there's time. 500 homes that get burned down mm -hmm. yeah and, and sometimes a couple of those were almost like unbelievably like in Medford that yeah. little trailer yeah. home Level. community yeah Phoenix like, well yeah. Uh, talent like right next yeah. to Phoenix. the freeway you're driving by the freeway yeah. and it's just leveled like a bomb went off yeah that's and, weird uh, Blue River on the Mackenzie's the same way Vita wow. I, I mean you drive down the Mackenzie and it's kind of like this on the North Umpqua on the archery fire but on the Mackenzie there's more residences that were right on the road yeah uh, and yeah. it's like a hundred homes in a row that are just all that's left is the stone fireplace. Wow. I mean, man, it, I, no thanks, it's like man. the walking dead or something yeah, like yeah. that. I it's mean, like yeah. looking at a skull. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, I know what that is. Oh my gosh. I wonder yeah. what happened to that yeah. poor soul. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like that in the trailers and maybe some of the newer structures that don't have like a rock type feature mm -hmm. in them. There's nothing. There. They're gone. <laughs> yeah. They're just gone. And, and it's funny because as you're driving by, you're like, man, I was very, gas station here or <laughs> like i i like think so but lot. now there's nothing <laughs> yeah so you don't have right. any reference and that's nuts you know somebody that grew up like in glide you know everything so well yeah, yeah. every geographic point you and, go around a bend in the road yeah. and you know what's going to be and on those, your left yeah yeah and you have these little markers in your head and now yeah. you go there and you're like man this is a totally different place yeah, yeah. so before we talk about the lumber aspect maybe just explain that because glide that town we all grew up in, I guess. Yeah. Um, we all graduated there and yeah. we are all recovering. Barely. <laughs> we made it. Yeah. Um, it burned and it's not yeah. the same. And so this is very close to home. Yeah. And maybe just, I guess that's all that needs to be said, but you were there when the fires were happening, right. not not for the timber aspect, but because you thought yeah, your so, parents' home yeah, was going to- Yeah, the fire was coming over the hill down yeah, to your dad's yeah. place. I had to evacuate my in-laws. Mm -hmm. I had to evacuate my parents. And it was like, pull up the enclosed trailer at 11 at night and- we're yeah. like, okay, what are we going to take? Like, yeah, 
weird feeling. Yeah. And a lot of And people, totally expecting it to to burn through everything. Yeah. I mean, that was the expectation. And wow. the whole uh community did that. Yep. And some portion of them came back to nothing. And yeah. some people came back and was like, hey, we lucked out. In fact, there's that one house right on the north. I don't know why, but it's like everything burned around it. And there's mm-hmm. like one house right there. It's like, man, what a weird yeah. uh, the point is you don't know when is you're that leaving. The one that you can see as you go past the narrows and the before you make the bend by the as trailer go, park, yeah, as you go up Rock Creek on the oh, on the hill, over up on the point. Oh, yeah. that's still there. Yeah, wow. But but his guest house adjacent burnt down. Wow. Yeah, so. it's it's just it's hard yeah. to imagine what that must have felt like for these people when they came and saw all this for the oh, first man, time. Oh man, I can't even. Yeah, it separate was, from just the drive, yeah. which is now like so they. I think in Glide there were a hundred homes that burnt down. Uh, yeah, I think hundred or one ten uh, or something, something like that. that. Yeah. And and then all ev- obviously every structure that was with it burnt down as yeah. well so barn and there's a lot of those like lots of outbuildings yeah lots of outbuildings barns and sheds lots and- of boats lots of rvs <laughs> yeah it might pickups. not be running yeah. but they were there yeah. Um, yeah yeah um did were there deaths did people uh die? No, there was one i believe one fatality died while fighting the fire to unrelated causes like wow. like a heart condition or, or okay, something like that, that in his right. vehicle and i've heard several residents from up there um attribute that win to Douglas County Sheriff's Office being on it and being aggressive and getting up there early with sirens. Yeah, I think and, so. and, and I think social media yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, really Facebook, like a lot of mm-hmm. community members had Facebook pages and Facebook groups that were updating on people. There. And I think that's a lot of it. Like yeah. the, the Facebook social media presence allowed people to know what was going on at that exact moment. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. All right. So let's talk about the trees because sure. a lot of this timber is just ash and smoke now. But when I drove up there, there was a lot of good looking trees around. So what, mm-hmm. what happens after it burns and um, to what extent is there, is it salvageable lumber wise? So it's my experience that when a fire goes through a Douglas fir stand, which these are like 90% to mm-hmm. 95% monoculture Doug fir, just mm-hmm. the nature of where we live. In and Washington. not that old. And yeah. So the BLM st- the private stuff. So the large private on the Archie was 35%, small private, 15%. So that comprises mostly like 30 year old to 45 year old. There you old. go. There Your you go. four service BLM, which was 20% four service, 30% BLM, it's older because it's that checkerboard BLM that uh-huh. hasn't been harvested for mm-hmm. 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that probably ranged from 60 to 200 years. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and so that's checkerboarded throughout that. But the, but the industrial stuff is is all tree farm yeah. that was scheduled to be logged either immediately or in the next 10 years. So so let's drill down on that just a little bit. That the first the first statistic you gave was talking about trees you guys' age. Yeah. And the second statistic was talking about trees my age and older. Mm-hmm. So that that is something that a lot of people that listen to this may not be processing. Right. That those trees, a, a, a sizable portion of the trees that burned were planted when you guys were born. Yeah. And I just want to emphasize the renewable nature of this resource, that that stuff is springing out of the ground around here. Yeah. And it's it's hard for people to understand that this the scope and scale at which we operate in Western Oregon for, mm-hmm. for tree farming. Yeah. It's huge. People are like, oh, you've cut all the trees. No. We're not really very close. No. Like, no. <laughs> and especially with the government not harvesting. Mm-hmm. any appreciable volume mm-hmm. their rate of decay ex- and and fire mortality greatly exceeds anything that we're logging harvest yeah, yeah. Oh, so really? the trees are falling over and dying at a greater rate than they're being harvested and have been for what 20 since 1992 or, there you go 92 <laughs> or so it, yeah, right yeah, that's right that's yeah. right the spotted owl and and they yeah. mm-hmm stopped logging basically just, just about the time yeah. that i moved back here yeah. <laughs> was when it just pinched right yeah. off so wow. we're logging up there now on industrial private ground um and, so and does, that, does that mean well. like land that sole purpose it's owned by yep. a, a lumber company or operation for farming trees is okay, that what you so mean yeah, by industrial so we have to get the terminology correct okay, yeah. so you'll be an expert after this spell so, it out so if you own timberland you're a timberland owner if you own a sawmill you're a sawmiller and you manufacture lumber huh. lumber is square timber is round mm-hmm. um and sometimes they're the same people. Yeah, they may. We have manufacturing. We manufacture lumber. We all, we also have a timberland division. We own timber in that as well. Mm-hmm. It's timber until it's cut. As soon as it's severed, it's a log. Uh-huh. 
So it, it's no longer timber anymore oh. if, it, if it's not attached to the earth any longer. And it becomes taxable. Yeah, yeah and that's right. <laughs> then the then the government treats it differently as well. So yeah. Oh, that is it, such a that's such a useful way to think about that timber while it's alive and growing. Yep. Logs and, and when it hits the ground. It, it's common that people use those terms interchangeably. Mm-hmm. They use lumber, timber, and logs and tree, like kind of all in the same sentence. Yeah, like, yeah. oh, I've got some some timber I want to sell you, or I've got some lumber I want to sell you, or... You know, yeah, it's like, I don't know. want lumber. <laughs> right, exactly. So <laughs> I want to sell you my lumber. <laughs> so there's there's been a change in the way that timberland is owned. So in the last, and I don't know the exact history, but maybe 20 years, investors realized that trees grow every year. Like it's, 8%, uh, right? 8 well, to 10%? <laughs> or 2 to... <laughs> yeah, depending. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah. 2 to 8, or maybe not at all if they're on fire. But, sure. So... They're like, well, it has an internal rate of return. It's it's appreciating in value no matter what. No matter what. Yeah, no, every no tenant single to like year. chase yeah, rent. Every out single over year. And yeah. it's and it's a true guaranteed appreciation, yeah. less the risk of fire or environmental regulation. Yeah. Interesting. So it's very appealing for somebody that's a conservative investor, like a pension fund or interesting or a, a municipality that has money or um like a, a, a large fund for like Stanford or, or some, something uh-huh. like that, where they have a billion dollars yeah. and they need to allocate it to things that are safe, that aren't going to go down. And they have yeah. costs every year that they know that they need to generate cash flow on. So other people in the industry formed groups and they go identify timberline properties that are for sale that maybe were historically owned by local companies or, mm-hmm. or maybe even just private individuals mm-hmm. from a hundred years ago. They find these properties they build a package and they present it to the private equity people, the pension fund. And they, they could be anywhere, maybe not even in the U.S. Yeah. Uh-huh. They take their money, they go buy the timber land, and then they say, I promise you I'll give you this rate of return. We're going to harvest this much a year. We've mapped it all out. And you'll make this, this amount of money. And then they take a fee off the top. So they're basically like a mutual fund manager. Mm-hmm. That's, that's really what they are, huh. this middleman. Yeah. It's difficult for people to understand that because when you look at the ownership map, you're looking at three layers deep of of what's really going on. So, for right. example, in Glide, there's a group called the Forest Investment Associates. They're based out of Atlanta. They own 14,000 acres in Glide. Mm. And it was old. Originally, I think it was warehouser ground. Mm-hmm. And it's been sold a couple times. Huh. Up Cabot Creek? Yep, they have some mm-hmm. up Cabot mm-hmm. Creek, but mostly up Rock Creek, mm-hmm. um, East Fork mm-hmm. Rock Creek. and But then they represent shareholders. So their name is on the ownership, but they're they're strictly a land manager. Hmm. So then all of the people that own that timber, they're um, just people who have a pension fund, really. So is that land insurable for fire? Are Typ- these- typically, no. Wow. So I do know that there is some insurance that you could get for the reforestation costs, but generally nobody insures timberland. Wow. It, it's one of those things, and it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Like, It's a risk that it's really hard to predict hard to control. Um, most people have insurance in the form of buying their own firefighting equipment. Right. Or, right? So that's their insurance is they yeah. say, well, we're going to keep some guys on staff. We're going to buy a grader. We're going to buy a water truck. Huh. We're going to support the local firefighting organizations. And that's their form of active insurance. Yeah. Or by buying lots of parcels spread out. So if there's a fire right, somewhere, yeah. it won't burn all of it <laughs> to the yeah, ground. And I don't think that's, they're not buying them with that in mind, but that is a, a consequence of having them spread out is yeah. that you're you're spreading your risk out. Sure. Yeah. So oh. to the fires up there, we've been watching all these loads come down, you mm-hmm. know, and all those 25, 35, 45, 55 year old stems, scorched, dead, sound. So these these um, timber holding companies, now they have 14, let's just say 14,000 yep. acres of standing, dead, sound trees and a time to harvest is now. Yeah. So it's not that their investment is gone. It's just that it's thrown them to a different part of their cycle early yeah right is that fair that's fair the hard part is is you're flooding the market yeah yeah in a normal fire circumstance let's say that the fire burned ten thousand acres and let's say 30 percent, the same ratios were private ground and they were going to go clear cut those that 30 percent. that's not going to flood the market yeah in this case um the, the estimate was like 15 billion board feet got burned up wow that's uh, a number yeah <laughs> which is not even comprehensible yes, even no, for me and we no. cut a lot mm. <laughs> so it's flooding the market and and we all knew that it was going to happen so yes their investment is salvageable but it's a race to mm-hmm. the bottom get yes get right. there while the checks are still so, clear in the yeah, bank yeah. so 
drill into that a minute because when it's burned up, some of it, like you said, it, it's standing and dead, but still mm-hmm. sound. Is some of it burned up and completely gone, or is it kind of when you say it's burned up, meaning it's killed? You got to harvest mm-hmm. it now. It seems like there's two simple yeah. things happening, and there's different in fire intensities. These fires burned through super, super hot and super fast. They were like uncharacteristic winds, and yeah. so they ripped through there. Like oh. they burned like fifty thousand acres in like three days. And the wind was the driver. That's yes, what made this non typical. Yeah, had an east wind. Yeah, yeah, and. So it, it scorched the tree, it burnt all the needles. The tree can no longer do photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Yeah. So it it it's still there and yeah. the wood is fine inside. The bark is scorched, uh-huh. but it's not going to live beyond the, the time that it can um, evaporate that water away. Yeah. But for sense. now, I mean, this winter, while they're up there processing those trees, those trees are essential, have essentially all the characteristics of a live tree in June. I mean, it's wet. Very wet. You slap the saw yep. into it, the water flies. The, when the bark gets to ground, it'll yep. split off in a chunk. It, they are as if they were alive. They're just kind of standing. Actually, the bark, you, so nor, you know how the, you have a sap flow in the yep. spring. Yep. It's yep. The bark doesn't fall off. The bark is tight. Okay. And I'm not really sure why, but so to for listeners that don't cut trees every month of the year, mm-hmm. a Douglas fir tree has a time of the year when it's growing, when sap runs in the tree. It's called the sap is running and the sap is going up and down. When that happens, you can take like a, an ax or a hammer smack the tree and you'll have a big piece of bark slide yeah, off yeah. during the what they call the sap flow saps up yeah um and the trees are heavier as well during uh-huh. that time the fire didn't happen during sap flow it happened at the end of summer the trees are super heavy like it's sap flow but it's just moisture mm. and that's a result of the trees not being able to expel the water from oh. photosynthesis so the root system's still pulling water that's up, right. but the leaves can't get the needles can't get rid of it right that's interesting so the bark is uh. tight the bark is singed the tree is soaking wet and in some cases like i would say i ran some moisture tests on it like 10 percentage points higher than a green tree at the same moment in okay, time. Okay, that blows me away. It's really, not, it's not what you would expect. No, you would uh-uh. expect the tree to be instantly dry, but yeah. but it's not that at all. So huh. you're in a race now. As the tree is evaporating the water, it will start to dry out. As it dries out, the, the bugs will enter into the tree because the tree is weakened. Uh-huh. And then the bugs are deteriorating the wood and the birds wow. are deteriorating the wood as they pull extract the bugs and the wood goes from full value today to half value next fall to zero this time next year or something yeah and arguably it's going to go full value to to maybe zero value yeah. rather quickly because in the market of selling lumber today if you have bug holes in your board you're gonna you can't sell that to home depot Done. yeah yeah because huh. even though we kiln dry wood the bugs are dead the bugs are dead yeah. and, and the board <laughs> is sound there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with mm-hmm. that board if you go if mm-hmm. if we have a bug ridden board and it's structurally sound enough to make the board mm-hmm. and we kiln dry it it's fine the mm-hmm. bugs aren't going to eat your house up but mm-hmm. as a retail customer if you're at the counter and you pick it up and there's one adjacent to it that doesn't have bug holes i mean which one are which you going to take yeah, yeah so and now, so that's so interesting because a bug hole is a far smaller defect than any of the knots that are found in that right. board anywhere yeah i mean but you don't mind the knots but one bug hole dead deal yeah that's and i think it's just the perception that you're putting bugs in your house yeah or, yeah. or something along those lines your and, wife just doesn't like it yeah and, and if you have a better looking one sitting next to it why take would you it. take it yeah. so so what, what do you do when you when you saw into a log that has bug holes where does it go right so let's talk about the start the beginning of how logs are purchased right so they're good okay so we're in the business of buying logs measuring them sawing them turning them into lumber then selling it that's that's our core business so we buy logs from people that have timber for sale and logs for sale right Both. both and most cases people are selling their logs they're going to arrange the cutting the transportation all of those things they're going to deliver that log for a quoted price that i quote to our yard at that point we'll measure the log and inspect it for quality and that's that's your your log scaler Mm -hmm. and which is a, a profession a third party that is a neutral party that's inspecting that log to see what that sawable volume is within Mm -hmm. the log once it's been measured and recorded, then we'll pay off of that measurement um, to the prearranged the, price to, to the contracted prearranged price. Mm-hmm. And that price fluctuates. It depends on who you talk to, but in my opinion, daily. Mm-hmm. So sure. it depends on 
a few things, how many logs I have in my yard, what the price of lumber is, what I think the delivery rate is going to be in the near future, all of those things. So it's Mm -hmm. a supply and demand thing based on seasonality and the price of lumber. So hold that thought. And for the listeners, those numbers are quoted in random lengths, right? Random lengths is the industry standard sort of ongoing quotation of lumber prices. Lumber prices. Yes. So not log prices, but lumber prices, finished product prices. So yes. There's a, a publication that comes out. It's a little bit confusing because the organization is called Random Lengths and Random Lengths is referring to a futures contract as well. Mm-hmm. So they're not necessarily synonymous, but they're kind of the same thing. So Random Lengths is a publication that comes out based out of Eugene that compiles information from lumber salesmen and it's voluntarily given. It's not like a, a reported thing like mm-hmm. like the stock market. They're not it's the not IRA. transactional. Yeah. Okay. Like, so they're like, Hey, yeah, I sold it and I sold it for this price. And mm-hmm. everybody is submitting, self-submitting their prices. They take mm-hmm. those prices, they average them. And then mm-hmm. that comes up with your market price. It comes out on Wednesday and Friday. Is that, is that specific to this area? Is there well, a it's random nationwide? Length? It's like a nationwide yeah. price. Wow. And so the traders are looking off of random and saying, yeah, random links is this, we'll quote you this. So they're basing it off of that. So that's, that's our stock market. Uh-huh. It's maybe not entirely accurate because it's self-reported. It's not transactional. Like but it's if, as good as we've got, right? It's as good as we have. And nobody wants to, Yeah, do, it, you would have to go through a clearing house, uh, some sort of a neutral clearing house to have your transactional evidence. You need a log scaling bureau for prices yeah. on, on lumber sales. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so that's not going to happen, yeah. but, huh. but it's close enough that everybody works off of it. it but when you say everybody does that mean all the mills everybody if you sell lumber or buy lumber and that means panel products as well so osb oh, um plywood, to, all, plywood of it. all of it oh, okay got it so sh- it, er- eric, garretson, eric garretson always had or has a random blanks laying on his desk yeah you yeah. know so in other words the both the buyers and the sellers are reporting their yeah, numbers yes. on there that's just everybody's correct. putting as much information on the table as they can yep so that everybody can be like well it'd be like a I don't know, the MLS or something, you can see what yeah. comps sold for, yeah, right? It's, it's a comps uh, and it's past transactions, most recently traded. Huh. So it's not indicative of the future in any way. Uh, also in the report is Lumber Futures, which is a publicly traded uh-huh. product that goes through a transactional, which is the delivery of, uh, I think, 110,000 board feet of Doug Fur, random, which is called random length. Mm-hmm. So that futures price is something that an investor could buy yeah. to hedge against the price of lumber. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And that's referring to random lengths means that the lengths are random within that unit of the lumber. Lumber sold that way. Feet. Our listeners don't know that. You can buy r- lumber in random lengths. It's right. just the way it comes off the head rig in, a, in an all around sawmill. Right, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And that's how they used to make it yeah. before everybody decided they were going to build their houses all nine feet tall. <laughs> yeah. So this, this answers a question I had both on paper and just in my mind, you know, the, the retail price at, at the store, that number changes all the time. Yes. And it's always like some, Greatly. you know, <laughs> random specific number and year over year, sometimes it can be wildly different. Yeah. And I've kind of wondered that, you know, like I know that you guys don't set price, you know, you sell for what you can sell yep. it for, but this really answers that there's mm-hmm. this sort of... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, people don't realize it's a commodity. Mm-hmm. It's no different than oil or gold or silver or any of those and things. Gasoline. It's a, yeah, it's a it's a product that they should all be the same because there's a set of standards that we're yeah. all up, up holding to, the lumber standards that we manufacture them to. West Coast Lumber Grady. Yep. Talk yep. about that in a while when yeah. you're ready. And so we're selling the same thing. Everybody is. So it's easy to see that the prices move up and down like yeah. they do. Oh, and and we should mention that prices are quite high right now. Is that right? They're record level. They just okay. hit twelve hundred dollars for per two thousand. by four by eight. Hear that twelve hundred dollars per thousand. That's a dollar and twenty cents per board foot. Yeah. So spell that out in terms of like what it was a year ago and five years ago. So like a rolling kind of average decent price, like three eighty. Yeah, yeah. So when we built the house, it was yeah. probably hitting four hundred, four and a quarter. Right in there. Yeah. And now it's three times that. Almost. Yeah. Unbelievable. There we go. And that's it's three the, times. Yeah. It's three times what it was one year ago. And almost. that's across the board for all, okay. two, all two products. Years. We were framing yeah. oh, two years yeah. ago. Yeah. yeah. So um, cedar, fencing, uh, plywood, OSB, floor joists. That's why those sheets that we had painted Everything. last week cost 100 bucks a piece. Oh, wow. I didn't okay, know that. When we built the house, they would have been 
$59 a piece yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh normally gosh, I tell people, crazy. you know, they're like, oh, uh -huh. price of lumber went up, price of lumber went down. I don't want to build a house. And normally I'm like, it's kind of a small as a percentage of the That's total right. build. And you'd know better than I would. 20% lumber, the frame and the framing labor is usually 20% of the cost of the house. Yeah. So if the lumber, if the lumber's 10%, then half labor, half, half material. So now if your 10% goes up 50%, you're still not upside down. Yeah. Yeah. So to what, to what is that attributed at the moment? I know lots of prices are high. Just from That's the big question, really. So in March, we were at like, well, so let's say February of 2020, pre-COVID, we were at maybe a million four housing starts annualized. So housing starts are always um, quoted as annualized, meaning in January of 2020, they're predicting what housing starts will be for that entire year based on get lock of guessing yeah. but also mm -hmm. what was being done in january mm -hmm. so it's yeah permits pulled and right and, and. so your annualized number as time goes on gets more accurate as the year finishes completion so february 2020 housing starts were say a million four and then in march after covid was announced they went to like 700 or 600 or something like everything stopped mm -hmm. flatlined manufacturing flatlined mm -hmm. for everybody because mm -hmm. they didn't know what was going to happen. People yeah. were buying toilet paper. People weren't coming yeah. to work. <laughs> buying canned goods, you know, whatever, waiting for yeah. the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And then everybody realized, well, I'm sitting at home. I don't really have anything to do. I'm still getting paid. I think I'm going to build a dog house <laughs> yeah. or I'm going to build a deck or I'm going to do a remodel or yeah. interesting. I'm going to do a DIY project or I'm going to watch essential craftsmen and learn something. I mean, mm -hmm. so all of a sudden this, this home renovation DIY market started to grow and then it just went crazy. Really? And this is at the retail level for products. Mm -hmm. um, and then people are still working from home. This is all pure speculation. Like yeah. this is sure. just me guessing, but Everybody's still working at home, especially if you're in a corporate environment. They don't want you there, mm -hmm. but you're still getting paid. Right. And you're like, I really don't like living in the Bay Area. It kind of sucks here. And mm -hmm. I don't like driving two hours every day. My employer is going to keep paying me. They are encouraging remote work. I think I'm going to move. Wow. And so they're moving. So multifamily starts are, are down in general. Yeah. Because people aren't building apartments. Like everything commercials off on the yeah, downside and it, everything. Some of that has to do with the fact that in a lot of states, Oregon in particular, you can't evict anybody. You can't raise the rent. So as a, as a large mm -hmm. multifamily landlord, like you're not excited to expand or to buy anything. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That is so amazing. So, so now like housing starts are annualized for... 2021 we finished the year at like maybe a million 680 i think so that's that's a pretty big increase and they're saying a million eight for uh 21 huh. and you have manufacturing a fixed amount of manufacturing that was producing for a million four a year ago and then you have a lack of efficiency in manufacturing from covid shutdowns and voluntary shutdowns during the pandemic because some corporations just said hey we're going to close the doors for a little bit yeah but just i mean has your mills output slowed down in other words the demand must have jumped obviously to explain part of the price but has supply like been constricted by covid to any extent on uh, for us zero huh but but we're privately held yeah we control our own destiny a little bit better than uh, maybe a big corporation sure go. um and we're constrained by labor to yeah. be honest i mean we have record level unemployment i know that uh, CNN would say that there's people unemployed everywhere, but locally, that's not the case. That's right. That's um, right. Unemployment is record low. Like pre-COVID, we were at like like 0.1% unemployment, like yeah. true full employment, mm -hmm. where in order to find somebody qualified, you would have to pay them more than they're currently making to leave their job. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you're going to get somebody. Yeah. There's hiring bonuses and all kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And I, and I still think that that's the case for many jobs. There, I mean, there are just... Trades people are maxed out, manufacturing is maxed out, huh. and they can't find anybody. Interesting. So, is there any likelihood that all of this, swinging it back to the fire, all of this influx of supply that are swamping the market and the mills will help alleviate some of this demand, or is it just kind of two separate things? 
I mean, the sawmills are trying to manufacture more, but yeah. like we aren't capable of outputting any more than we already are because of the labor constraints. You're already at max. You've we're been already, at max. You're always yeah, at max. We're always at max. And yeah. that's a good point is that the nature of our business is that we're always at max capacity. We oh. don't fluctuate because your manufacturing costs are fixed yeah. and you want your output to be as high as possible to reduce your fixed manufacturing costs. So we're not messing with that number. I mean, if it's for sale, I, if we can sell it, we're going to make it. Yeah. And and hopefully, if it's bad, hopefully it gets better soon. I mean, that's kind of our mentality. <laughs> so, so in other words, these logs that are coming and flooding the marketplace aren't necessary. They, they probably are stacking up and there really is kind of so, a, yeah, so, a little bit of a, an issue here with these logs not being put into service or so there's two lumber. two things going on two supply and demand dynamics there's the the local area log market then there's the nationwide lumber market yeah, yeah, finished separate. product market and they're independent of each other uh -huh. they, they shouldn't be and they're yeah. correlated to some extent because if you're not profitable you're not <laughs> going to keep making it yeah and you'll adjust mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. when you run out of money you'll mm -hmm. either quit or lower your prices yeah but Right now, we're at an oversupply of logs locally. In locally, locally. In, yeah. and I locally meaning three hundred square miles or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Domestically, we're short on supply on lumber. Mm. Interesting. On a nationwide. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Wow, that is really crazy. All right, so um, is there anything left to say about these forests that have kind of burned? And in other words, lots of these trees are getting cut into lumber and they're fine. I guess we'll know later so, so how you, much of those are totally wasted. So you mentioned but, a race to the bottom. I mean, the yeah. 15 billion we're in the feet. Middle, we're in the middle of it right now. In the middle now. of the, right now. So 15 billion feet of wood. Got to, that's How many years local output is that? I mean, guess. Yeah, so For scope and scale, like we, we cut maybe 90 to 100 loads a day of logs. And that's throughout that seven day period. So delivered is over five three, days. Is that 3 million feet a day or something? Yeah. So it's 220,000 board feet of logs or 250,000 board feet of logs, roughly. Okay. Of um, Per shift. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. running about a million round number. Yeah. A million feet a day yeah. output. Yeah. And we're like, like I said, mid-sized, like we're not a monster mill, but mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a bit. Yeah. And we're running two shifts. Huh. Um, so, so, so you guys could maybe realistically do 300 million feet in a year. Yeah. So you can handle a third of a billion feet in a year and there's 15 billion feet yeah. on the ground with a shelf life. <laughs> and what's difficult is a lot of this is government of uh -huh. that 15 billion. So meaning, it, meaning the meaning government owns meaning, those, those, yeah. that, those, uh, that timber. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we own it. And, yeah, and it will uh, yeah. probably not probably it will the ninety nine percent of it will rot until it falls over, and the next fire comes through and burns it again. The termites own it. Let's <laughs> yeah. be straight on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, wow. So that yeah, that's so how that crazy. works. It'll yeah. rot. It'll fall down. It'll make fuel on the ground, yep. and it'll burn up in the next fire. Yep. This um, when I went up the river and kind of inspected it, it was probably I don't know around Christmas time, but it was amazing. There's logging operations. Everywhere you look, it seemed like a rock. There's just like equipment everywhere, and it felt like a cleanup after a tornado, kind of. And, yeah. it, and it was, but it also is kind of cool that for a lot of these guys, it's a kind of a it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot work. of it's a lot of work, you yeah. know, separate from just taking it to the landfill. And yeah, I mean, it's been a it's been a huge benefit for the local logging yeah, industry exactly. for trucking and and equipment manufacturers and all those things. Like they've mm -hmm. they've done well this last year and. You know, I know a lot of industries aren't doing well, like food service and yeah. hospitality and yeah, entertainment. Gyms. Yeah, gyms, all of those things. They've done poorly, but in, in our industry, it's been really good year. How about that? And I think that's true for a lot of people that manufacture things that are essential or however you want to call it. I mean, mm -hmm. they're still being consumed mm -hmm. and, and at a, maybe even at a, at a greater rate than before. That was interesting about the, the do-it-yourself market and let's build a yeah. doghouse and it's time to fix that bathroom triggering just as soon as yeah and i'm sure yeah. you guys have seen your viewers mm -hmm. ha express more interest in how do we do that and how yeah. do, you know it, it, it's hard to separate but there certainly yeah. was no dip in fact there was just sort of a little bump up in number of views yeah that coincided yeah, yeah I, but you're right separate even from the person the diy person building doghouse but i don't know a lot of tradesmen are now maybe been home and they're you know they may be doing a full of another floor on their house oh, or yeah, something sure. you know there's some also some probably pretty 
solid projects that are people are like oh, yeah. now's my chance I, i'm laid off i'm building mm-hmm. i'm going to build that cabin or, or who knows what but it's probably uh, yeah. everything from dog houses on one end to pretty serious yeah. projects on the I other i do know that there i mean we're seeing it because we're sold out through march and we can't supply the market with the products that they require hmm. obviously the price keeps going up so that's reflected in that yeah. but i know that that's true for many products like appliances and tile and carpet and roofing and mm-hmm. insulation yeah. i've heard is really hard to get mm-hmm. yeah, so we, mm-hmm. all of those prices are going up i mean interest rates are being held down and that's mm-hmm. encouraging people to buy yeah. and, and people like i said are trying to move out of the city so that's encouraging them to buy but man the cost of construction are they're growing rapidly yeah. i know that uh politically people say that there's no inflation but i would beg to differ yeah. like yeah. <laughs> go down to the building to store and try to buy something and yeah, tell well, me that prices not have not inflated just look at lumber <laughs> look at lumber um so in terms of those guys doing the logging how does that work i mean all of a sudden in whenever that was middle of september there was logging galore who mm-hmm. who gets to do that was there like some kind of like a auction or something mm-hmm. for who gets to do that work or how, how does that how does that happen yeah so there's <laughs> There's the small private guys, which is the guy that had five acres in his house that burned up and he needs to get that cleaned up. There's that guy guy, and and he might maybe have he might be getting help from FEMA um, because there's a lot of FEMA assistance up there. Or he might have the local excavation contractor or maybe even like the guy that's going to build his house is helping him. Mm -hmm. So there's that level. Then there's the next level or or maybe like the one man show logging company. Then Mm -hmm. there's the next level, which is like the small private landowners that maybe have a couple hundred acres 500 acres they're going to go hire a logging contractor and negotiate log prices with a sawmill like ourselves and sell those logs Mm -hmm. and and they're going to put it out to bid or maybe they just have a logger that they normally work with Mm -hmm. and then there's the large industrial companies that have you know that lost twenty thousand acres and they're going to take all of their resources that they have typically contract loggers that are scattered about their lands not necessarily there they might live over at the coast or whatever and they're going to say hey we want everybody here so define a little bit contract logger Mm -hmm. so back in the good old days of logging people had integrated logging companies and were vertically integrated so they had a company logger and so the company the sawmills had a a sawmill that worked in the sawmill owned the land they owned the logger they owned the road construction roseburg lumber they owned everything yeah Yeah. in warehousers warehouser yeah and uh willamette industries Mm -hmm. and and that was the model at the time and it's kind of like um, like a mining company is the same way. They, mm-hmm. they owned everything. Mm-hmm. And it starts with the logging camp. Like, mm-hmm. I think that's yep. the history yeah, of it. Yeah, logging There's camp. The, logger, the timberland owner builds a camp and he owns all of the, the, the logging equipment. He hires all his own contractors. He manufactures the lumber. He sells it all. He may even have his own lumber yard mm. as well associated with that. That model's changed. And sawmills don't think that they should be in the logging business, that the that individual contractors do a more efficient job Mm -hmm. and so i would say that i mean there are still some companies that have their own company loggers but it's not a popular model Mm. or common necessarily and so all of these guys may have 50 employees or they may have five or seven there's all varying levels of of size now i would i would say that there's probably very few companies that are exceed maybe 70 employees or, or something like that that's kind of the biggest. These guys size. in an earlier time were all Jippo loggers, right? right? And they're yeah. still called that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would still call them that if sure, they're a they're small, gypos. yeah, and meaning like that's what Dad and I were. Yeah, you know? yeah. So you're a, a gypsy logger, mm-hmm. I think, is where it comes from. So you're willing, you mm-hmm. travel yeah. around, and you'll take whatever job suits you and leave when you want, and mm-hmm. you're not beholden to anybody. Whereas before, the other loggers were a, a stream, uh, like were, part of that payroll. vertically integrated. Yeah, yeah. They were in the logging camp. You can't get out, man. You still owe me rent on that cabin. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And your food bill at the company store. Yeah, is not exactly. I mean, and, indentured servitude yeah, is really what here. the <laughs> the, <laughs> the Samo was back uh, then. Interesting. And so then, yeah. gypsy loggers started showing up, and yeah. everybody's like, "What are those guys doing?" <laughs> yeah, and independent people, and yeah. and they have the same thing. I mean, they're we call it a gypo trucker is an independent trucker who may have one truck or two mm-hmm. or three. You kind of get to a point where you're no longer a gypo if you have like 50 trucks. Yeah, yeah. And you're yeah. just not referred to that anymore. There's, yeah. I don't know what that threshold what, what would you is. Call them? I don't know, but you're just like, but you can you, tell when you see. You're them, a right? trucking company, yeah. And you're a, you know, you have an HR department. And yeah. You have a policy for, you know, mm-hmm. you're you're a real organization as yeah. opposed to somebody Everybody wears the same color reflective. Yeah, 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 exactly. So hmm. th- that's the market now. Then the the last level would be the government selling timber sales. Or maybe a private contractor selling a timber, I mean, sorry, a, a private timberland owner like FIA 
that doesn't really have their own resources. They don't have the connections because they're based out of Atlanta and all those things. So they're going to sell, uh, say, we're going to sell 500 acres on a scaled sale. Who wants to buy it? And then somebody like myself would say, oh, I'll pay you this much for it. Scaled meaning I pay for what's removed. Mm -hmm. So it's measured at my facility and I pay for it as it's removed. As compared to buying a parcel of timber. Lump sum. Yeah. 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 So a lump sum amount would be like, I will determine, I will predetermine the volume out on the land. I'll give you this much, this fixed dollar amount, and I'll take the risk on whether it's there or not Mm -hmm. there. Hmm. And I'll take care of the logging. Yep. Take care of everything. Yeah. I'll just give you a check and you give me a timber deed or however that works. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then the last way would be the government. And then the government is going to sell timber sales. And this is their standard method. They'll put it out a 30 day notice. They'll, they'll do a NEPA. They'll do an environmental analysis and an EA, an environmental assessment of all of the effects and ramifications of selling timber, which is mandated by federal law. So Mm -hmm. They're going to say there was a fire. We want to we want to do some logging on this 40,000 acres. These are the effects of the logging. They put it out for public comment. People comment or they don't or protest or not, depending on mm-hmm. what it says. Then they'll they'll bundle that up into different timber sales of varying sizes that they think are going to be marketable. They'll put them out for auction. There's a 30 day notice period and then people come in and bid on them. Got it. And and we haven't really seen that. They the government's not quite as efficient as private industry is getting those types of things done. A lot of that because yeah. of the administration process to mm-hmm. go through the, the yeah. environmental assessments. Yeah, they, they, they're probably just receiving their NEPA yep. in hand they are. right yeah. about yeah. now. Yeah. We're like, so, okay, what should we do here? Yeah, and <laughs> they they know the the urgency is there. It's not that they don't want to put it out. It's that sure. they're yeah. beholden they, to they got rules. They have rules a system, and man. They and, have a system. And they don't make exceptions. And, and there's talk of maybe changing some of those policies so that it could be expedited in the event of a fire because it's an emergency situation. Yeah. Yeah. There are life safety issues that are accumulating yep. up and down the trails and stuff and roads, yeah. uh, roadsides and campground, every, every single campground burnt to the ground. Right. And so they're yeah. not accessible to the public because of uh, hazard trees, yep. every roadside that you drive, you know, you drive through a road, you don't realize you're in the middle of BLM half yep. the time. And, they need to go through and drop all those trees adjacent to the road and yep. and get and take them to a mill. Wow. So we did a quick video when this was happening and it was understandable how emotional everybody is, whether you're closely connected the way you guys are or whether you're just, you know, in some big city. It's just it's just such a tragedy. And it seems like there's lots of opinions about why this is happening more and more often. What what's like the point of view or the perspective from the sawmills or maybe yourself personally, but could you give some perspective to this forest fire? I don't know, like season. That's just like almost like the holidays now. It's like, Hey, it's forest fire season and it just gets worse and worse. So I I don't know to what I'm ready to go into that a little bit. Okay. (laughs) So I would just like to clear up one comment that, that you hear. This is the, the common one that say these fires started because of global warming. That is not the case. Those fires started because there was a high wind event. There was some arson mm-hmm. and power lines fell and started a fire. Mm-hmm. That's, and, and we have fuel loads that are through the, ch- like through the roof on our, throughout most of the lands. We have roads that are not maintained by the government because they lack the funding to do so because we don't allow them to log. They don't get money to do it. I and mean, that's why it happened. Mm-hmm. So a- emphasize that there are power transmission lines that yes. run right up and down the North Umpqua river East wind blowing branches out onto the transmission line. Bam, you got a spark. It goes to the ground. Yeah, and, really? and not accessible quickly. Not accessible. Yeah, can't yeah. get there. You can't get there. And that's a product of we as people saying we want to pay this much for power. And in order for power to be this rate, the lines are overhead. Mm-hmm. If we yeah. want to mitigate that risk, they have to go underground. Mm-hmm. However, power is going to go up. Like, mm-hmm. That cost mm-hmm. is going to be pushed to the consumer eventually. To the, to and, the people and, that use the power. Yeah, and we as a people don't want to have $1,000 power bills every month mm-hmm. or whatever it costs. I have no idea what it would cost to sure. take them all underground, but that that's the trade-off that we've made is yeah. we, we, we did accept that risk. I don't know if we're willing to accept it now because there's a lot of talk of going underground, but... Well, the West is so spread out and it's compared to like the East where there's just cities everywhere. Right. I mean, there are, I don't know, power plants. I don't even know where the nearest power plant is around here. Well, Tokity. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's a long, long the hydro away. substation. Yeah. The hydro when you fly in the Columbia River. Yeah. Yeah. When you fly in, over in here from an airplane, you can see what you're talking about. Like the power lines yeah. just like 
like yeah. a highway, just like yep, and a you, cleared strip. Yeah, and so that makes yeah. a lot of sense. That yeah. it, I'm sure they send like a helicopter crew to like clear it out, but yeah, it's well, hard to get to. Well, right now, I mean, so in in the wake of the fire, there's a lot of finger pointing. You bet, you bet. I, there it is <laughs> because people want to know when, when your average citizen is sucking smoke. Yeah, and yeah. is at risk and of, is terrified and is terrified. They want to. They want answers. Like, okay, who's responsible? Yeah. And the the quick expedient answer is to say global warming is the problem. Right. Now that we is, solve that question. Yeah. And and I just that's totally inaccurate. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that global warming isn't a thing or that climate change doesn't have some effect on the increased temperature. Let's say that it raises the temperature of the earth by yeah. one degree. Okay, perfect. Like I don't disagree with that, nor do I agree with it. I'm just saying that okay. It's like a separate I accept conversation. That. Yeah, it's kinda. a separate conversation that yeah is a mitigating factor but it is a very small one yeah Mm. it's separate from what started the fire yes it's separate from the fuel loads it's separate from inaccessibility into where the fires are a lack of forced management over the last 30 years Mm. by our federal government Mm. and and i don't at this point i don't blame the federal government i blame the citizens of the united states it's us it's us we are the federal government we are it yeah and 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 we as a people have pushed a message that we we don't want to log yeah that's right. So what when you say lack of forest management, what, what do you mean? And is that just mean like the hands off, like don't log it, don't yeah. cut firewood in here, don't don't cut a Christmas tree? Or what, the road. what does that yeah. mean? So yeah, so that's one of them. But there's a big push and for years has been to to make roadless areas, um, to make them contiguous stands of forests that are inaccessible by by motor car. Oh. And so they don't do road maintenance. If you can't do road maintenance, you can't access something. You can't put a fire out. <laughs> you can't put a fire out. Interesting. Um, and, and it, you know, you can issue firewood permits all year long. You can give them away. There aren't enough people out there to go cut enough firewood down. Like, it's <laughs> yeah. not at the scope and scale that you need to be to manage that kind of land volume. Yeah, it's like getting a Christmas tree permit. It's like, good, yeah. And, Anyways. <laughs> and so monoculture, I support it. Okay, yeah. Th- this country is better than almost anywhere else on the earth at growing Douglas fir, which is the one or top two or three softwood species in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Southern yellow pine and whatever else. And this country grows it. It grows out of the ground explosively. And when these Douglas fir trees are small, those needles are laden with very flammable oils. They're close to the ground. If there's a fire, they're going to catch fire and boy, do they burn. Mm-hmm. So that that is a function of the forest regenerating itself, a flammability aspect for a while until the trees get up taller. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And, and I would argue that let's say that you had a mix of hemlock and red cedar and madrone and maple. It's not really going to change it's still the, gonna the burn. nature of that. Yeah, That's it's still right. going to burn. I mean, what? What prevents it is having thinnings and clear cuts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Fire breaks. Fire breaks. Big fire breaks. So yeah. a lot of people are thinking, undoubtedly, that's fine, but it ignores the wildlife who's living in these. The, in other words, the thinking behind untouched or unroaded areas is it's better for the wildlife to live there. So to what extent has the wildlife been um, impacted by uh, well, the fires I, yeah. and, and all of I that? Mean, how, I, how does that play into this? The the bigger conversation that people aren't having is that we live in a world of trade-offs. <laughs> That's right. And and the trade-offs are, well, there, people will say you shouldn't log or build roads because it increases sedimentation to the rivers and it does this damage or it doesn't do this damage and it's measurable or not, you know, whatever. But we're trading things off. Mm-hmm. And, and the mm-hmm. trade-off is, well, would you rather watch it burn yeah. Would you rather burn a million acres? <laughs> I mean, because that's the yeah, potential that's right. risk. That's right. Would you rather let the lumber prices where they are now become the norm? Yeah. Are you comfortable paying three times what you would have paid for the lumber two years ago? Which means houses and rent are going up. And paper. And paper. And every and other and thing. Are we comfortable rather? with that? Yeah. Do you want to build with metal studs? That's right. Do you want to build metal studs that come from Chinese steel factories that right. pollute? that pollute at 10 times the rate of, that's right. of steel manufacturing in the U.S. And because the, that's the, that's the alternative. That's you, the alternative. Do you want to live in a home? Do you want <laughs> or would you rather live in a yurt? You know, I mean, and, and there's right. silly, silly games you can sure. play, but, but, it, yeah. but it's a world of trade-offs and people are like, well, th- don't do that because this is bad. I'm not here to say that it's bad. I'm just saying that it's a trade-off. Yeah. And we as a people have made the decision that that's right. we don't want to manage the force. Right. We want to let them be and do their thing. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's but fine. These so, are the these are the consequences. Summertime, of it. they always have and they yeah. always will be vulnerable to fire. Yeah, and that's not going to change. And one interesting anecdote that people should know because I can't stop thinking about it at this moment is how the fish hatchery burned down. Oh, yeah, man. I know. Oh, yeah. And man. it's like 
Oh, yeah. We can all agree that we want more salmon steelhead in the river. And we had this beautiful, and I don't know how long it's been there, fish hatchery oh, of Rock Creek. Line. I, when I was like, a kid, I did like service. 80 years 80 or, or 100 yeah, years. Like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, I did service projects there when I was a kid, cutting fins. And, fins. and they yeah. would have handicapped fishing days. And it was, it was amazing. It was classic. No, yeah. nobody alive could like criticize that, hey, we're putting more fish into the river. Anyways, it burned yeah. down. Yeah. It's yeah. gone. Who knows if it'll get rebuilt? I guess, yeah, will it? Or do you know? I, I, I don't know. Long shot. There's, there are people out there that think that the fish hatchery should not be rebuilt. They oh, really? That's right. Like, because oh, they think geez. that we are molesting the balance of nature by putting hatchery fish in the river. Oh my gosh. There are people that think that we shouldn't be logging the burnt timber, that we should just let it decay. That and, in their heart of hearts, they think that yeah, strongly. They believe it. And it wounds them to think that we would go up and take those trees off. Yeah. Mm. It, it's so interesting how, how differently we can all see the same yeah, they they think that okay, so if you log it, then you'll replant it, and it'll become another monoculture, and you will have yet another acre of monoculture. Hmm. I mean, that's their that's yeah. their fear. And I look at it like there's still value in it. Let's salvage the value, get it replanted back, get it growing again, and do it again. Boy, there's yeah. no better example but, of what we're talking about than Mount St. Helens. Yeah. Okay. There is no better example on the planet, and I recommend anybody who ever wants to go to Mount St. Helens in Southern Washington to see the devastation that a volcano can wreak and to see the difference between between warehouser's response to their devastated forest and what our public servants did to our devastated forest which was nothing now i will i will freely admit that it's interesting to see nature doing the best she can but boy what a contrast yeah. warehouser went up there and just took care of business they cleaned up the mess they put trees back into that volcanic ash the trees loved it they exploded out of the ground and you got vibrant second growth forest blanketing the hills on one side of the road and you know the blueprint for creation on the other side yeah. and it's pretty rough yeah mm. and we're going to see the same thing on the archie creek fire yes yeah, and, and the beach fire that it'll be the exact same science project that's right <laughs> and you can see it there there's a good example as you drive up the north umpqua on the right hand side there was a fire there two and a half, three years ago called the Swift Water Fire. Yeah, yeah. Burnt through, burnt on government land, burnt on private land. The private land went in and harvested. They replanted. The government didn't do anything, generally. Hmm. It reburned when the fire came through, and it looks like desolation. It burned everything. It burned the reprod that the timber companies had planted. Mm -hmm. However, it also reburned the snags from the government ground that didn't get logged. Now it's like borderline. You, you can't even walk out there. Don't go there. Yeah, because because the overhead risk is so dangerous from all the snags. Nothing um, is going to grow. Now now you can't even replant it yeah. at a reasonable oh risk Oh, my goodness. Level. Yeah. That is just amazing. Well, it is. definitely a huge tragedy, hopefully. Yeah. I don't know. Like I think you really summed it up. It's like, the, the gen generally speaking, the people of the country who we all care and we're all we on all the same care. page. Uh, we're like, all saddened. We want healthy and vibrant uh, forests and God, we got just got to find a way to, I don't know. I don't know how we, I don't know how you change the moment, the, the direction of the forest management at it's, this point. It's really hard because the people that live in the forest and that are directly responsible for managing it and logging it, like people like myself yeah. and people like you guys that live mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and are affected by it are such a small minority of Teeny. people. Inconsequential. And, yeah. And so the voting block of our country and, and let's say our state, there's what are there? 3 million people in Oregon yeah. rapidly increasing yeah. also. But so Portland has say 2 million. Mm -hmm. I'm just a rough estimate sure. of Portland Metro. They vote for everything. And mm -hmm. you know, they are, aren't, directly connected like we are and, yeah. and they're going to vote for what they think is right that's right and and what they think is right is what they see on their screen i mean it's the evidence of their eyes i mean yeah. they're seeing it and we vote be based on the evidence of our eyes which is on the ground itself yeah right and so it's just a radically different perspective and it, it's hard for me to express to people that i'm doing what i think is in the best I, i'm not moving anywhere like right. I'm, your roots are here. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to leave. Like, why would I do something that's detrimental mm. to where I live? And 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 for that same matter, like corporations, they get a lot of heat. Like a company like Warehouser, like they're publicly shamed regularly by people mm. that are saying, "Well, you're raping the lands." Like these people are in business for perpetuity. That's like, right. They do. They want an investment to be there again. Like they're not mm. doing it to hit it and leave. That's right. Yeah. Like they want 
timber lands that are productive forever. Yeah, yeah. That's they, their business model. Let, let me make up. A, uh, let me assert something that may or may not be true. But Warehouser, I've got to believe, owns property that they are probably as a corporation logging for the fourth time. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's a productive, reasonable way yeah. to approach timbering. It's difficult for people because our sense of time is so hard to comprehend beyond now. No. Mm -hmm. So timberland is a crop and it just so happens that the rotation in in Western Oregon is 40 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it's hard for people to comprehend that. I I know a guy that was a timber manager for BLM before the big transition in the early 90s, right? And BLM in this part of Oregon had all of their holdings laid out on a 150-year sustainable rotation. Bam. Bam. The whole thing was tracked at 150 year turnover, but not anymore. It's like you said, it's decaying, it's burning, it's falling down. So now there's zero turn. It's essentially, you know, it, it's, it's so, it's just so different. It's yeah. so different. And before he died, he's dead now. He died a broken hearted man. He was a timber manager and he thought he was doing a good thing and they understood it and the oh. end and done. Okay. No, really? They'll, they'll, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of irony in the fact that environmentalists, uh, and 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 it's not even fair to say environmentalists like your general public like the person a person that lives in let's just pick a state Iowa that is a conservative person and believes in extraction of the earth and all those things and they would say at face value well, I don't think we should do clear cuts that doesn't seem right right, right. and so it's not just environmentalists it's right. everybody but in that push to block the government from extracting anything from timberlands it's put a tremendous amount of pressure on private timberlands oh and yeah and yes. so, so the demand is constant relatively mm. of lumber consumption in the u.s That's it's right. not varying Gotta greatly have the boards yeah so the boards are going to be found from somewhere and whether yeah. we cut them in new zealand or western oregon on blm or, or siberia or siberia yeah. somebody's gonna cut them yeah and and so it's putting intense pressure on private timberland and that's decreased the rotation cycle and increased yeah. yield and increased the pressure for monoculture, all those things. So mm-hmm. it's detrimental to private ground to some degree because of the environmental policies that protect the government. And so while mm-hmm. those trees rot, we're hammering the industrial ground to meet the needs of the general public to yeah. build yeah. dog houses. The law well, of unintended consequences. Yeah. Well, hopefully, thank goodness for these high lumber prices, because maybe <laughs> maybe if they quadruple a few more times, <laughs> yeah. it'll start yeah. ringing. You guys are going to do a video on how to build with metal studs. <laughs> it yeah. to like two thousand. Eight metal studs, man. Well, they there's are no something. Fun. There's something to that. There I sure mean, is. If people start it's building sure out is. of concrete, hey, maybe there is. Maybe there is something there, and it'll get. You know, it'll help was, alleviate. A there was bit a lumber market spike in Las Vegas not too long before I moved out of there, and a lot of the home builders. There was such volatility in lumber pricing. I mean, you it was t- 1990, right? Yeah, yeah, probably. That was so. the last. Yeah, that, that, that was a high it. peak. Yeah, that was it. I mean, we know them. <laughs> yeah, wow. in fact, I think to, I think in 1990, yeah. two by twelve was like 1,100 bucks a thousand. Yeah, logs hit a thousand. Okay, in 1990, that's the only reason why I, I know the that's log right. history. That's so, a, that's yeah. a milestone. Yeah. And so there were plenty of home builders that began to engineer and design and anticipate. We're just going to build them with metal studs, boys, because we know what the price is going to be three years to it from now within five or eight percent or whatever the number mm. is. But no telling about the lumber yeah that's changed now though with the tariffs on because oh yeah you know in 1990 we weren't importing this the level of steel that we are now sure and so we you know that was coming from pennsylvania or wherever yeah, I don't yeah, know. yeah i think yeah. that's where they make yeah, steel pittsburgh steel yeah, works pittsburgh, right yeah uh, but now it's coming from china and, yeah in korea and and uh with the tariffs that went on i mean like metal prices are expensive volatile yeah mm-hmm. Scrap prices up and down, steel yeah. prices up and down. Yeah, mostly up. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. easy answers, are yeah. well, Let's get some of that down. <laughs> yeah. Well, John, this is just totally fascinating. And I, I'm so glad that you came. Yeah, Any, yeah. Anything, thanks for having me. Anything to share or leave the viewers with? Oh, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things. Um, on the website, mm-hmm. which we'll link to, Doug, what's the DCF? So it's dcfp.com, douglascountyforceproducts.com. Okay, there's a video there that we'll link to of a life of a tree, kind of this whole process, mm-hmm. you know, quick and quick and dirty sort of. But in general, what I'm coming away from this is just, man, getting informed. There's really something to be said there for getting is. informed. Yeah. And it's not, it, it's harder than you think. Getting the actual, one, even just one side of the story, not to say this is mm-hmm. the whole story, but hopefully the viewers because, feel informed because i i certainly yeah do. google's a wonderful thing but these are really complex issues yeah. that aren't readily available 
Yes. And and aren't on people's radar. And and the number of people that are intimately involved is a pretty small number. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. though they greatly impact a lot of people, there aren't that many people that are log buyers. Yeah, and it's That's it's right. it's one of these topics where everybody has a right to have an opinion because it's such a part of our life and existence in the forest yeah. and we care about the planet and so it's everybody should have an opinion on it but yeah. but man it's and it's easy to be I don't know. It's easy to have an opinion without being, without knowing as it's much. It's the of easiest the, thing there is. I mean, <laughs> we all have all our opinions, yeah. but the actual amount of information we have is small. But on right? the forest in particular, like, yeah. well, I think we shouldn't clear cut them and burn them. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, most well, people's, I do too. Yeah, but. Most people's <laughs> ideas of forest management is cartoons that they saw as a child. That's right. Like Fern Gully yes. and Bambi and, and yeah. things like that. And I don't know like now what kids watch it, but I'm sure that it's there as well. Power Rangers was kind of like that oh, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it's everywhere. Uh, there was another one. Captain Planet was like yeah. a pro environmental mm-hmm. cartoon. And, and that's the reference point for most people of yeah. what needs to be done. And I think people's natural incl- inclination is to protect forests at all costs yes. and not do anything. Yeah. That's the, the, the answer right away. And yeah, yeah. well, I'll, in, in case somebody's still listening and, and would, would have an opinion. I would love to talk to a forest service person and sort of get, not that there's necessarily another side to the story, but certainly another perspective well, on it. Yeah, there's other sides. There's plenty sides. Yeah, there's yeah. lots. Well, yeah, okay, there are lots there of sides. There are many sides to this and issue. And it would be great yeah. to have uh, some perspective. So if yeah. you as a listener have an idea who that person might be, um, have them reach out. Thanks for tuning in. John, thanks for taking the Thank time you. to chat with us. Check out the website, everybody. And um, we'll put any other links in there that might be helpful. We've certainly done a few videos about about this topic. So yeah, we'll put that in there. All right. Thanks everybody. We'll catch you next time. Thank you guys.